Welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Scott Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. I'm excited. You know, the one thing that I kind of miss, I know you guys do it with your horns and different things, but it's, I, I miss kind of the interaction a little bit when I'm up here. So they put together, uh, so I got a laugh. <laughs> I like that. We got loud clap. Uh, we got, uh, this is one of my favorite. I think this is important that the church needs. Yo quiero taco, man. <laughs> You gotta have that in every service. So two blondes were driving to Easter Church uh, on Sunday, and they decided to take a shortcut down some old dirt roads. And as they're flying down the road, all of a sudden this gigantic rabbit just jumped out in front of them. And the driver blonde tried to swerve left and then right, but at no avail. She ends up running, hit running right into the rabbit, and uh, a basket and eggs go all over the place. Well, they they stop suddenly and get out and run out frantically, and sure enough. There was a rabbit laying there, had a, had a, a beautiful little uh, playful vest on. And one blonde goes, you just, you just ran over the Easter bunny. You killed the Easter bunny. What in the world are we possibly going to do? And so the other blonde, she, she, she reached into her purse and she pulled out a, a, a spray can and she shook it up like this. And then she began to spray the rabbit up and down and up and down and up and down until finally the rabbit's eyes opened up and the rabbit jumped up to the feet and began to wave. And then the rabbit kind of hopped off a little bit and began to pick up the eggs and put them in the basket and just kept waving and kept waving until it hopped all the way out. And the one blonde goes, what in the world is in that spray? And the blonde goes, oh, it's called hairspray. It restores life to dead hair and adds a permanent wave. <laughs> that might be the dumbest, best Easter joke I've ever done, amen? <laughs> Open up your Bibles. Oh, yeah, we got to do the... <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, <laughs> Revelations 3.20 is going to be our scripture today. Here I am, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, eat with that person. In other words, have some fellowship, have some time, begin to grow our relationship together. Today we're going to talk about doors, doors in our life. And I want us to leave here today really understanding the difference between closing a door and opening a door. You know that doors are one of the oldest inventions around. They believe that it was predated even before the wheel. And if you think about in our given day in our life, we probably use doors just about more than anything else. But the difference between an open door and a closed door out there. You know, when the doorbell rings and you look through the little peephole and it's one of your family members or one of your, your, your great friends, you open up that door, say, come on into my world. The open door signifies, come on in, let's have some time together, let's, let's grow together, let's have some fun together. But when the, the, the gentleman outside the door is the one that is serving notice for your speeding violation, your photo radar, there's a different reaction. We're going to keep the door closed right now. We don't need you to be in my world. I don't need to have what you have. You don't need to give that to me. Open door and closed door. You know, at the job, when you walk into the boss's office and they say, close the door, that doesn't oftentimes mean a good meeting. It, does, it means a meeting if you tell me what's wrong with me or maybe I'm no longer going to be part of the team here. You're, you're moving me, demoting me. The closed door is not a good thing. But when you work in an office and they have an open door policy, that's kind of fun, meaning that we can work together. Like as a team, we're trying to accomplish the same things with this open door policy of growing and going in the same direction in life, that the difference between an open door and a closed door. When it comes to maybe your spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, and the door gets slammed in your face, right? What does that say? And they said, hey, I don't want you in my world right now. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You have your side of the world and I have my side of the world and you're not welcome on my side of the world. And what happens, let's talk to the gentleman there as we're talking through the door. Our ultimate goal is to get that stupid door open. That's all that we want at this moment. And I'll say whatever it takes because there's something glorious that happens when the door slowly opens. It's saying, all right, you've said how many mistakes you made. You've, you've reached the, the final, the limit that you need. You've said you're sorry enough times. And now let's restore this relationship. The open door is an incredible thing, while the closed door 
isn't that good? It blocks off. It, it holds back. It says, hey, I don't want you to be a part of this. When I get home, I walk through the garage, and uh, the first door when I enter in the house on my right is my son Heath's door. And his door right there, when it's closed, you know, it's kind of like I walk by and go, hey, Heath. And he's like, hey, Dad. And it's kind of boom. But when that door is open, I love that. I can step in and say hi, and we see it. And it, it, there's a different feeling that happens with an open door and a closed door. About three weeks ago, I took the doors off of my Jeep. Took the doors off. Now, my brother, he gets in the Jeep. He's like, okay, this feels very unsafe. And so he's like, I don't even think I can hold my phone. I feel like it's going to fall out. So he puts it in his pocket on the other side away from the door. But you know what I, I found out even this morning when I drive the deep Jeep without doors, people talk to me. It's like an open door thing. I was trying to enter, exit my gate today and a couple were walking. They're like, happy Easter. How are you doing? Good to see you. And they, they never say that when my doors are off. At stoplights, people pull beside me and they're like, hey, where is the motor vehicle department? They ask me questions. It's as if I'm saying, open up, talk to me about whatever's going on in your life. My Jeep doors are off. Uh, this past week, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon and I hadn't had uh, any breakfast and I hadn't had any lunch. And so Scotty was quite hungry. And so I, I called Holly up, I called my wife up and I, I said, hey honey, I'm, I'm gonna take a quick trip uh, to heaven right now. And heaven signifies Taco Bell. I'm gonna go to Taco Bell right now. And I know we have dinner about six o'clock, but I still Scotty needs a little bit of something in his belly. And she says to me, Scott, this would be the third day in a row that you're getting Taco Bell. And I said, well, honey, this is Easter week, and Jesus fought death, sickness, and hell for three days. The least I can do is have Taco Bell three days in a row to kind of, in a way, celebrate. She's like, well, that doesn't celebrate Easter at all. I said, oh, it's probably more of a celebration than eggs and a bunny, and so it's my way of celebrating Easter is to go down and have a little Taco Bell. And she said, absolutely not. Well, no, no Taco Bell. You've had enough Taco Bell. And so I hung up the phone. So then I pulled into Taco Bell. <laughs> And I pulled up to the drive-thru. And I, and I knew it was God the second I pulled up because right there on the screen was the chalupa. It's the three chalupas put together. Once again, another Easter sign for me, the number three. I said, oh God, you're all over this. I'm going to get me a chalupa. So I, I pulled up to the window and I, I got my chalupa. If you don't know, it's three chal chalupas all put together in a glorious form. And as she handed me a chalupa out, and you may not notice this because it's very faint, but when they hand a chalupa out the window, you can hear little angels singing. You have to listen closely, but little angels are singing while you pull the chalupa out. Well, I had to hide the evidence I knew before I got home. So I pulled the chalupa out and I put it on my seat and I crumpled up the bag and I put it underneath uh, my seat so it wouldn't fly out of the car. And I pulled up to pull out a Taco Bell onto the main road and I had traffic, praise the Lord. And so I was able to tear off a little bit of my chalupa. Oh, God's goodness right there. Surely I serve a great God at that moment as a, I'm just tasting the flavors of heaven. All of a sudden, a brake was in traffic. And I'm like, oh, there it is, my brake to go. And so I slammed the, the gas down and I turned left out. And as I turned left out of the corner of my eye, I witnessed my chalupa fly out the side where there was no door. It's the second time this has happened to you. Some of you remember my Outback Bread did the same thing. You'd think that I would learn by now as my chalupa hit out into the middle of the road. And here's my takeaway. This is what I learned from that. Road chalupa is pretty good. I don't know if you all knew that. It's not bad. You take off the gristle and, and, the, and the stuff, it's really good. How many people know that open doors in life are a good thing? And we serve a God of open doors. That Jesus up there, come on, somebody out there, amen. Wait, 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 let's do the clap. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we serve a Jesus that is open door. You know, you follow his life, and you'll notice that religion... You know, those that have the man-made rules, they're all about closing doors. They want, they, right, they close the door in a way to the church. You can't come here unless you live this type of life and you're doing this and that and making people feel like they're not welcome and closing off doors. But we serve a God, we serve Jesus who, who went forth and showed the world something different, that he wasn't about you being right, but he loved you right where you're at. He was all about opening doors. Whether or not he was at the women, woman at the well, 
all. She's a Samaritan woman who, who showed up and already had a wall closed. You know, Jesus' whole goal is to get the walls down so that she, he can make a difference in their life. And what does he do? Does he judge her? Does he condemn her and tell her everything that's wrong with her? No, he simply just listens, loves, accepts, get conversation going until she begins to ask and open up her door. And in that moment, Jesus was able to get her saved, which then she got the entire village. Her whole village was all saved because Jesus wasn't condemning. He was opening the doors. Blind Bartimaeus shows up and the, everyone around is like closing the doors. No, 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 you can't get to Jesus. We don't want you to get to Jesus, right? Jesus, we don't want any of that pressure on him. And what does Jesus say? He says, let him come to me right? Let the demon-possessed guy come to me. Let the leprosy come to me. Jesus is always about come to me. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter about your past. I simply want to love you exactly where you're at and help make a difference in your life. The hurting world doesn't need to know what's wrong with them. They need to know that God loves them in spite of whatever's going on in their life, that he loves them exactly the way that they are. Change nothing about you, but God loves you because God's an open door. God. He's like, come on in. I don't have to close doors on you. We oftentimes do that on our own. Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house. All the religion at the time says, you can't hang out with Zacchaeus. He's no good. He's one of the worst sinners of the time. And what does Jesus do? He goes with an open door over to Zacchaeus' house. He doesn't tell Zacchaeus everything he's doing wrong. Doesn't tell Zacchaeus the things that Zacchaeus needed to do to make things right. But in a love and an accepting atmosphere where you open the door, Zacchaeus at the end of the night says, hey, I'm going to give everything that I stole four times back to all that I stole. You see that in an open door relationship, I don't have to change people. God gets in there and God begins to help them change the things that are limiting their life. Gets them to make better decisions and better choices. It's not our job to change the world. Our job is just to love the world. Our job is not to shove Jesus Christ down their throat. Our job is to show them what Jesus Christ really looks like. That Jesus is love and Jesus is acceptance. That whatever people are doing, they just need somebody to say, we love you where you're at. Right? The world doesn't need somebody to push them down. The world needs some people that are picking them up, lifting them up, and encouraging them. Yeah, come on. Let me get the little, woo! Actually, no, no. Let's do a better one. Ah, there it is right there. Amen, amen. I was, uh, a week and a half ago, I had, um, my Mac stopped working. So it just wouldn't go to the internet. And what I found about my Mac, it could do everything but go to the internet. And now it's useless because I can't get to my files. I can't get to any of my Dropbox stuff. I can't check any of my emails. I can't, get, I can't even print on the, on the wireless printer. I can, do, I can put a rock in my office and it'd be better than my Mac at this point. It's useless without the internet. And so I can't even get a hold of Apple support on the internet. So I have to call Apple support. And so I'm on a hold for 57 Minutes, 57 minutes I'm on hold. And finally, Kaylee comes on there. Now, right, I could be all angry and all mad and tell her everything that's wrong and how, you know, I'm 57 minutes and what is your company doing? I don't even know that she's not going to go, oh my God, let me change the company. Like, okay, I'm going to work. Right? She's going to be like, well, what do you want me to do? But she'll be nice. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Right? I could put my frustration and anger on her and I could close the door. Isn't that what we do sometimes with waiters and waitresses and servers and people around? Like when we don't get the perfect service, let me tell you how you can do it right. That doesn't make them, actually, that just makes and spit in your food is all that. It doesn't do anything good to your world. But what we do is we do different. We love and accept them. So when she got on, on there, I just said, Kaylee, I'm going to tell you this. This is probably going to be one of the greatest phone calls you've ever had. I'm fun. And we're going to have a whole lot of fun, me and you. It's going to be so much fun, you're not going to want to get off the phone. And actually, that ends up being true because we were on the phone for an hour and 17 minutes trying to fix my Mac. In an hour and 17 minutes, you can find out a lot about a person. And what I found out about Kaylee is, Kaylee, you're in the wrong profession. That's what I found out. You were not designed to fix computers in any way, shape, or form. I'm sure that you have a lot of gifts and talents, but fixing computers is not one of them because we got nowhere in an hour and 17 minutes whatsoever. But you know what? I wasn't telling her what's wrong. I just kept encouraging her. Even when she would leave, oftentimes she would leave and go, hold on, and she put me on hold, and we both know what she was doing. She was watching YouTube videos on how to fix a Mac, and it wasn't working very good. And so she would come back, and I'm like, oh, man, I don't know how you do it. You, 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 
you're so patient. You're so good with people. I said, you, you fix problems all day long. And I was being loosely with the fixed problems. You fix problems all day long and helping people out. Yeah, you keep such a good attitude. And you could tell that she was, in a way, just smiling even over the phone. And it was kind of encouraging her and building her up. And a few times throughout it, I would say, oh, God is so good, right? Because it looked like we were going to fix it, but I knew she wasn't going to fix it. And so we, right, we had a great time. And... You know, somewhere maybe three quarters through, we, had, uh, we were waiting for the computer to reboot, and she goes, so what do you do for a living? And right then I went, oop, there it was, God. That was the open door that the whole conversation was all about. Had I been frustrated and angry, I never would have got the open door opportunity. So I said to her, I said, I'm a pastor. And she says, oh, wow, that's, that's neat. I'm glad you're a pastor. And so then we went back on to not fixing my computer for another 20 minutes or so. And I kept trying to say, you know what, I'll get off. She's like, no, no, we're going to stay on this till we fix it. And I finally, I had places I had to go, so I had to lie to Kaylee. And I said, oh, my God, it's working. We got to the internet. Oh, my God, that's awesome. Great job. I can't believe we did it. Wow, this is great. Yeah. It's all over the internet. And uh, she said, all right. And uh, okay, if you need anything else, you know, you can give us a call. We got a case number. I said, sure will. And then there was a long pause. And she goes, you know what? I can get in a lot of trouble for this. She goes, but would you mind saying a prayer uh, for my family? I said, well, yeah, of course. She said, my, my uncle is in intensive care right now. He's, got, he's getting worse and worse and, and worse. He's got COVID-19, and I, I, the whole family's just, just a mess. I said, all right, well, I'm going to pray right now. She goes, right now? I go, yeah, I want to pray right now. That way, if they're listening, they can hear it. And so we prayed for Uncle William at that moment, that time, and we got off the phone. She was very grateful, very thankful. And then about four days later, I got an email. I don't know. How, I guess she just pulled it off of the thing. And uh, let me pull it up here. And they'll put it up on the screen for you. Dear Pastor Scott, with one T, because she thought that was funny. I had to let you know that Uncle William got better all of a sudden. It was released from the hospital this morning. God is so good. Thank you for your prayer. Come on, somebody out there. Come on. What I want to say to you today is, you know, life is not about the hustle and bustle, and it's not what I get out of it. It's about leaving doors open with everybody that cross our path. Because one of the most important things I did that week was simply showing somebody love and encouragement. And you know what she's going to say to her family and to her village is what a great God that we serve. We serve a miracle-working God, right? It's impacted a, fa a whole family. Who knows how many people it impacted? And what I'm saying to you, let's work hard as a church to leave doors open. Not to condemn. Nobody wants to, you don't want to find out all the things that are wrong with you. Nobody else does. Well, I just told my coworker this and that, and they need to fix this and that. And I told this person, this family meter, I just told them that they were wrong. You know what? No one out there likes to find out they're wrong. What we do like to find out is that we're loved and accepted. And if we can go forth into our family meetings, our family events, if we can go into our, our, our places of business and with our employees or with our employers and our coworkers and to all those around us and simply show them the love of Jesus Christ, God will find a way to open a door for you to speak into their life and to make a difference. I don't want us to be door closers, but I want us to be door openers. We don't need to be like the Pharisees that wants to tell people everything that's wrong with them, but instead we want to be people that encourage and love people right exactly where they're at. I was challenged this week on Facebook to see if I can make this uh, story relevant, and I believe that I have. So I have changed in my lifetime with five children, 9,238 and a half diapers. The half is for the one that there's a little controversy between me and Holly about whether or not it was done properly. I'm going to give myself at least a half on it for effort. And so I've changed many diapers over the course. And if you've been here for a decade, you'll know about a decade ago, I made a vow and I said, my last one's out of diapers. I'll never have to change diapers again. I forgot that I would have grandchildren one day, so I got a grandchild now coming in, in June. And so my mind is kind of like, am I going to hold up to my vow? Right? Actually, the big question is, how long can a baby stay in a dirty diaper before it has to be changed? That's going to be the big question, whether or not I can hold out to this vow of not changing it. But I, here, and this is for all those that are new parents, parents-to-be, Lake and Camille, they're coming up. I have a way of finding the rainbow in a storm. I do. I can find the good in whatever circumstance. And one of the great things about, about having children in diapers is the huggy wipes, the ones that come in the beautiful, amazing cylinder, if you all know what I'm talking about about. The huggy wipes are magical. We'd buy them, of course, for all the changing rooms, but somehow, some way, once in a while, one would find one in our bedroom or in our, in our bathroom. And there's nothing greater than a huggy wipes. 
even as an adult. I'm going to be honest with everybody out there. It's just, a, it's just it, it, changes, it changes everything in a sense. But then, you know, we stop having kids in diapers, and so we stop having the huggy wipes, and that's been gone out of my life for a decade. I'm sitting in the bathroom, and I glance over, and it's almost like heaven shone down, and there was the beautiful cylinder right there. What in the world? This couldn't have been Holly. We have no children. There's no baby in our house. Surely this was sent to me by God or an angel had delivered this today. God was smiling from heaven saying, today is the day the Lord hath made. Come on, let's rejoice and be glad in it. And so I looked over there and I popped that beautiful top off and I went one, two. I'm like, no, today's a three year. And I grabbed three of those amazing wipes, those huggy wipes, right? And I swipe one, I swipe two. And on the second swipe, I noticed a tingling feeling that wasn't normal. It was un, very unnatural. And then it slowly began to burn until it felt like I was on fire. And I turned it over to find out that it was a Clorox wipe. I didn't know Clorox made wipes. <laughs> didn't know that at all. There was a, a, a fire for a long time in my life. And what I want to say to you is religion is like a Clorox wipe. It looks like it's going to clean people up and it looks like it's going to make them better, but all it does is add burning and pain to their life. It doesn't make anything better. How many people know that Jesus Christ is the Huggies wipes? It's the one that really does clean up when we love and we accept people right where they're at. They walk away, they feel better about life, and life seems to lift up. I'm going to close with this last uh, bit here. Uh, Go with me to Colossians 2.13 and 14. I really want to close with this because I believe that oftentimes we close our own doors in our life between Jesus. We keep that door closed. It's because we feel like we're not good enough, right? The enemy reminds us of everything wrong we've ever done, all the bad in our life, all right, all the mistakes and things, and the, our addictions and our habits and everything wrong. And so we're the ones that close that door off and say, hey, God, you know, I don't know if I can let you in. I'm, I'm too big of a mess. I have people say, you know, I can't even walk into the doors of the, of the church because I feel like God's going to strike me down. But that's not the God that we serve, that, that closed door where we close the own, our own doors in our life. And here we find out in Colossians uh, 2, 13. When you were dead in your sins and in that uncircumcised flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Everything you've done, everything you're going to do when you get saved, he says, you know what? I'm going to take that away. I nail it to the cross. I don't see your sin. I don't see your junk. I don't see your mistakes. I don't see any of those things. All of that has been forgiven. I love this, that when you go on down to verse 22, he's like, because he's talking about man-made rules. He's talking about religion. He says, these rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with us, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining the sensual indulgence. See, they think that the Clorox wipes is going to clean people up, but it doesn't. Condemnation never makes people live at a higher level. Shame never makes people want to be better, and actually it makes them want to do the opposite. But we find out throughout the scripture that love and acceptance, when you have that love and acceptance, people begin to want to live their life better and do better. Probably with each and every one of my children, there's been that time with my boys, we'll talk about my boys, where I know that they're in the room and they're hurting and something's going on and something's wrong in their life. And I knock on that door, right? And I say, I say, hey, can I come in? And they're like, dad, my room is is, is a mess. And you know what's funny is I know it's a mess because there's a smell wafting from underneath the door as I stand at it with my boys. Right? It's a smell of like three-month-old Wendy's and dirty socks. It's just, right? But how many people know that I don't care about the mess? It's not about the, I actually, to be honest with you, I knew it was a mess. That's not a surprise to me. I don't care one bit about whatever's going on in that room as far as the mess. The only thing I care about is my son at that time. Son, I don't care. Open up that door. Let me in. I don't care about your mess. The door opens. And now it can be a hug. It can be an embrace. It can be a word of comfort. It can be something to bring some peace into them, bring some security to them. 
all along line. We're right in the middle of the mess and it doesn't matter whatsoever. And that's the same reason that Jesus is knocking on your door today. He doesn't care about your mess. Well, you know, if you knew half the things I did, they know everything. God knows everything you've done. But he's forgiven you of all of it. He doesn't care about your mess one bit. Not at all. He just wants to come on in there. He wants to help you heal that broken heart. He wants to bring some peace in the middle of your storm. He wants to give you some encouragement. He wants to fill you up with some joy. Yeah, but look at all these things I've done. He don't care. It's a mess. You know what I do with my kids after we get done? I'm like, hey, let Daddy help you with this Wendy's bag. <laughs> let me get this out of your room. Let's, let's, right, I begin to help kind of clean that up a little bit. And that's how God works. You let them in, and then God says, hey, you can't beat this addiction on your own. Let me help you with that addiction. Hey, let me bring some healing to that. Hey, let's work on forgiving over here and let's remove that out of the room. That's the process. Keeping the door closed is never going to do anything good. I want some of you out there today to know you found yourself in this parking lot. You don't know how that Jesus is knocking on your door and you've told him long enough that your room is too dirty. And I want you to know today he don't care about any of the dirt. He don't care about any of the junk. He just wants you to let him in so that you two can have an eternity together. Then we can worry about cleaning up the mess a little bit. God will take care of that. It's not about us putting rules on there. It's about God just saying, hey, you can have a higher life if we get rid of this, if we stop doing things this way. Maybe we remove that anger out of your life. God says life can get better when we start cleaning things up a little bit better. Thank you so much for watching today. We want to make sure that we secure your eternity. Eternity is a simple choice. It simply means I believe in Jesus Christ, that he died and raised from the dead. It doesn't matter. You, you may think, well, I'm not good enough and I haven't lived my life right. Jesus died for all of your sins. So simply say this prayer with us. Dearly Father, I ask you right now, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I am saved. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for all my sins and was raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. We'll see you next time.